I want to welcome you to the teaching on bitter root judgments. This is another teaching like performance orientation and parental inversion that's had a profound impact on hundreds of people here in our church at King of Kings. This teaching has high potential to help you get free in a major way. There are some things that are confusing to people, so if you can get past those things that seem contradictory and confusing, I believe it'll bring tremendous freedom to your life. The essence of the whole teaching is that God loves people. So we have to love what God loves, even when they're hard to love. When we judge other people, and in the strongest form, judging is called contempt. So when we show contempt for people, it's one of the most toxic elements in the whole relational universe because it devalues someone that God holds in high esteem. I'm going to use this CD to introduce you to something that we refer to here at King of Kings as the topic of fluency. I'm sure you're familiar with the regular use of that term as it refers to expertise in a foreign language. But the Sanfords have helped us gain a broader understanding of the concept than just learning a foreign language. At the core, the idea is that fluency requires a very high level of skills, two things really, a vast accumulation of knowledge as well as the real life application. So you might have studied French in high school and accumulated knowledge in the classroom, but that doesn't mean if you went to Paris, you could speak fluently with the locals. Head knowledge is important and necessary, but it's not enough. To truly become fluent, you do well to move to Paris and spend the summer there. You'd be submerged in their culture, and you'd build your fluency bit by bit daily in the cafes, not so much in the classroom. Similarly, our attempt to walk with the Lord benefits from head knowledge. We should read the Bible, we need to pray, attend church, a long list of disciplines. But our goal is not accumulating knowledge. In fact, I'd even go as far to say our ultimate goal is not just getting to heaven when we die, as wonderful as heaven is. No, the ultimate goal during this life is to be transformed into the image of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. To that end, I'm preaching to the choir because you've engaged in taking these classes, you're listening to the CDs, hopefully you're reading the books that we're recommending, and in all of that material, you'll find a common theme on the road to being transformed into the image of Christ, God, through his Holy Spirit and his word and many other ways, is going to reveal that there's been obstacles in your life that are holding you back from your goal, even on this side of the cross, even though you're saved. And yes, if you died today, you'd go to heaven, but that doesn't mean there aren't still obstacles that are holding us back from the fulfillment of the calling of God in our life. Obviously, the biggest obstacle is sin, what the Sanfords have done is help us understand the different delivery package the devil uses to deliver the sin to us. One of them would be performance orientation, which you've already learned about. Another will be parental inversion. There's many different topics that we'll cover. The one we're doing today is called bitter root judgments. We talk about fluency. We're using it to describe our growth in Christ-likeness, and it's this idea that the kids have on their bracelet, WWJD, what would Jesus do? As I walk out my daily life with my family, on my job, in my community, and I run across situations, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would he react? How would he treat people? Christian fluency means you'd respond the same way Jesus would in every situation. You become so knowledgeable and so practiced in how he would live his life, so full of the Spirit and so dead to your old fleshly nature, that however he would respond, it's a direct result of how you're responding. We also know that Jesus never sinned, so we have hope that we too can eliminate those besetting sins that are trying to hold us back. There's a verse that I love to quote. You do well to remember it, John 14, 30. Jesus said, I no longer will talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. That's important, nothing in me. Jesus is saying there's no hooks. He has nothing in me. If the devil had nothing in Jesus, then we can believe God for the same thing. No hooks, nothing to slow us down in our walk with God, and no little foxes that are spoiling the vine. We'll be such fluent followers of Christ that we'll live our lives exactly how he would live them if he were walking in our shoes. The base scripture that we use for this teaching comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. It says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So we see that in the area of relationships, God is asking us to pursue. That's an action word. 
to pursue peace, and not just with some people, but to pursue peace with all people. If we fall short of this goal of God's grace, we run the risk of a root of bitterness springing up, which causes trouble. Not just trouble for me, but trouble for many. That root of bitterness is a judgment that we make against another person. And it's especially damaging when we make that judgment against one or both of our parents, regardless of how bad the circumstances were in our home or how much you might feel justified to hold a grudge against them. If we do that against our parents, we're violating scripture because the Bible says, honor your mother and father. So we're sinning by holding a judgment against them. We'll touch on this more as we move ahead, but for now, let's focus on the pursuit of peace with all people. Try in your mind to go back in time 2,000 years. It's not easy to do. What was their culture like when the scripture was written? One thing that we know for sure, it was not like what we have in 21st century America. There were no civil rights. There was no democracy. There was no voting. There was no Christian culture that we take so easily for granted. Nothing on their currency that said, in God we trust. There were not even any social programs to help the poor. So the poor were despised and looked down upon. It was a barbaric world ruled by Romans who crucified people along the roadways that entered into the cities. So that way any newcomer coming in the city would know exactly what happened to people who didn't follow the Roman laws. And to pursue peace with all people, emphasis on all people, that was unheard of. Jews despised the Samaritans. They felt they were superior to all forms of pagans, anyone who wasn't a Jew. Women as a class of people had virtually no rights in the society and were treated as property, not even as good as second-class citizens or third-class citizens. They were like property. The Pharisees, the scribes, and the lawyers all looked down on the rest of the Jews because they were superior in their education. Most Jews of the day didn't even go to school, couldn't read and write. They were farmers and day laborers. In short, there was segregation, bias, and prejudice, and all these things were commonplace and expected into that kind of a culture, Jesus steps in, a servant king who washes feet of fishermen and tax collectors. The same Jesus who not only heals lepers, but he's willing to touch them when no one else would. The Jesus who said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Notice, it's all who are weary, not just a select few. And then all the way to the last chapter in the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says, Whosoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. There's no bias. There's no prejudice. Anyone who wants to can come into God's kingdom. They have access through the blood of the Lamb. So pursuing peace with all people was a major paradigm shift for these folks. We can look at a portion of scripture that's pretty well known in Matthew 22, verse 35, and it'll illustrate this point of fluency that I want to bring out. Verse 35 in Matthew 22 says, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So pause for a second and think about fluency. Remember, we're not talking about learning French. We're talking about learning how to live our lives the way Jesus would if he were walking in our shoes and being so fluent in what Jesus would do that we don't even have to think about it. It just comes naturally. So here we have an example of this lawyer who's actually going to test Jesus and we know that Jesus passes the test. He passed all the tests whenever anyone tried to test him. But if we look closely, we'll see there's a lot more going on here than what we see on the surface. The first thing to remember is that Jesus had to make a choice when he was looking at this lawyer, and he made the choice to have compassion on him and not to judge him. And if we think about it, if anyone ever walked the planet who had a right to pull rank on somebody, Jesus would have had the right to pull rank on this lawyer. He's the son of God. He's the sinless one. He was with God at the creation of the universe. And here's this lawyer challenging him and trying to test him. If Jesus was in a bad mood that day, we could easily kind of imagine him saying, are you kidding me? You're going to try to test me? Don't you know that before Abraham was, I am? Do you want to know who you're really talking to, pal? <laughs> now, naturally, he would never say that, but that's how we get in our carnal moments. That's not what Jesus did. He loved this man, and because he loved him, he engaged him in a dialogue. Jesus had a goal that he wanted to get this man further along in the kingdom and not just give him a smart answer. That's how we have to look at our lives. That's what fluency means. Not judging people, not writing them off, not devaluing something that God loves, but everybody we look at. 
to love them enough to say, God, what do you want to say through me to this person? And let me do it in a way that's so fluid that it would be the same thing that Jesus would do if he were here. Remember, bitter root judgments cause trouble and defile many. They act like cancer in our system and they poison us. Mother Teresa had a quote. She said, if you judge someone, you can't love them. So take a moment, reflect on the people in your life. Are there some people that you despise? Are there some people that you feel owe you an apology and you're not going to speak to them until they give you that apology? Are there some people who, if they walked in the room right now, you wouldn't speak to them? If you are harboring a judgment against them, it's slowing you down and hindering your walk with God. God's preference would clearly be that we find a way to forgive them. He even went as far as to say that we are to love our enemies. That's from Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount again, verse 43. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you... What reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Verse 47, and if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So if we want to understand the context, when he says be perfect, that means to be perfect, to be complete, to be whole in the kingdom. You don't just love the people who love you. But to be a complete Christian, a mature Christian, you also love your enemies and you pray for those who despitefully use you. So let's go back to the lawyer in Matthew 22. We remember he challenged Jesus. He tested him. He said, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And here in Matthew's version, Jesus answers and says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So we see something going on here. Again, Jesus didn't judge this man, but he's about to change the roles. It started out with the lawyer trying to test Jesus, but Jesus is so fluent in the ways of God that he inverts the process, and now he's going to test the lawyer. Now we can look at the same scenario, the same scene in the Gospel of Luke, and it's just a little bit different. When the question gets asked... What must I do to inherit eternal life? This is Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus throws a question back and says, What is written in the law? How do you read it? So in this case, the teacher in the law responds, Verse 27, so he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then responds and says to him, you've answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Verse 29 is a key though. It says, but he, this teacher in the law, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Here's the brilliance of Jesus and the fluency that's involved Jesus is now in a position to expose the root of segregation and bias and prejudice that lays in this man's heart. When he says, who's my neighbor? He's hoping that the answer is going to be a very small group of select people that he could get to love. He never expected the answer that Jesus was about to give. Because if he had to love the Lord, his God, with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, and his neighbor as himself, then he's hoping this pool of people is going to be a very small pool. Instead of giving a direct answer, Jesus uses a parable to illustrate the many layers of all the relational fluency he wants this man to consider. I'm not going to go through the whole parable, but many of you know it that are listening. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's a priest. There's a Levite. They both see a man who's been beaten up on the side of the road. Neither one of them stops. And then one of the people in the despised class, the Jews hated the Samaritans. A Samaritan happens to come by and help a Jew. And that just totally ruptured this man's paradigm. Paradigm is like an equation, like a worldview through which you process how you respond to other people. There was an equation that had formed deep in this lawyer's heart that said something like, I can scale how I treat people based on how I judge them. If I judge them to be worthy, that equals good treatment. I'll treat them with kindness and try to be their friend. But if I look at them and judge them as inferior, that equals bad treatment. I'm justified to treat them with contempt. They're not all my neighbor. I get to pick and choose who I want to love. But that's not the worldview of Christ. 
So as Christians, we spend our lives being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory out of darkness of that kind of worldview, of that paradigm that lets us pick and choose who we want to love and into the light of his unconditional love. So what we want to do now is tie these things together and try to get to the root of the bitter root, of that bitter root judgment problem. God is a relational God. The Trinity is a relationship. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all flow together as one. Right within God's essence are three parts that act as one. Of all the names that he could have given himself, he chooses one so intimate as Abba Father, Daddy. That speaks of family, of unconditional love and acceptance. In the garden, Adam and Eve were given the chance to have a family and have dominion over all creation, to establish a relational kingdom and fellowship with God. But when that event happened and sin entered into the world, all of that was corrupted. Thankfully, when Jesus entered the world, all of it was redeemed. He was born, he died, and then he was resurrected. He lived a sinless life, and that resurrection meant that death and sin had been conquered. The wages of sin is death, but, but oh death, where is your sting? It has lost its sting because of Christ. And now we have the assurance that we'll be completely redeemed at his second coming. Right now, we only see it in part. We have a foretaste of what it will be like when we rule and reign with him for eternity. We're his ambassadors. We're on this earth as Christians, the forerunners of the future life that we'll all have when he returns. We've been given Holy Spirit, and that presence in our lives is like a down payment. It's a foretaste in part of what our lives will be like completely when Christ returns. And given all that incredible promise of our future of ruling and reigning with Christ, a new heaven, a new earth, where all the original blessings of the Garden of Eden will be restored and we'll get to experience what Adam and Eve experienced before the fall. Here we are given a very practical two-step process that we're supposed to walk out while we're each taking our turn here on planet Earth. The first one, love your God with everything you've got. The second one, love your neighbor. And by the way, everyone is your neighbor. That leaves no room for judging people, yet we all do it to some degree. Even blood-bought, Holy Spirit-filled Christians can still be harboring toxic judgments against people who've hurt them. Look at the lawyer. Jesus could have easily pulled rank on the lawyer and condemned him for that haughty, condescending attitude. That's the easy way. That's the way of the flesh. But the way of the Spirit, the fluency of God, is to look past the outer package of the person that you're dealing with and see what God sees when he looks at this lawyer. God sees someone who's seeking, someone who wants answers and who needs salvation. So Jesus, in this fluency with the Father and the Spirit, uses this prophetic creativity to come up with a customized conversation with this man that will move him closer to the kingdom instead of the easy fleshly way of just taking out the bazooka and blowing his head off with scripture and condemning him and judging him. That should be our goal. We have to listen to the Holy Spirit's promptings before we open our mouth in a relational exchange with someone else. We can let God speak through us and bring that person closer to Christ through a life-giving, loving conversation and relationship with them. So I want to quote to you from the Sanfords. They write extensively about this, and I'll give you a story that they use about a husband and wife to illustrate how bitter root judgments form in our hearts and how they manifest bad fruit in our relationships, especially in marriages. The names have been changed from the real couple that received ministry. Their new names for this story are Bert and Martha. John writes, Bert and Martha came to me from ministry. Bert thought the problem was pure and simple. Martha was too fat, and he couldn't stand it. Martha felt awful about herself, but claimed it wouldn't be so hard to get the fat off if Bert would just quit criticizing her all the time. A few minutes of questioning revealed some root causes. Bert had grown up with a mom who not only became obese, but was also slovenly. She failed to care for her appearance. The house was poorly kept, and she'd used the toilet with the door open and the children running in and out. Bert judged his mother for her appearance and her habits. His bitter root judgment and consequent expectancy was that his wife would become obese and slovenly. Martha had grown up with a father whom she could never please, no matter how much she tried. He always found something to criticize. At least that was her perception. Whether her father was actually that critical was not what was important to me as a prayer minister. 
What was crucial was that she had judged her father. Since she could not honor her father in that area, life would not go well for her in all similar aspects of life. That's just right out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. One of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, that life may go well with you. Her bitter root judgment and expectancy was that the man of her life would always be critical of her. She'd never be acceptable or be able to be pleasing to her man. When Bert and Martha met, Martha was slim and a beautiful girl. They fell in love and married. Later, Martha became pregnant. And as she grew in size, so did Bert's difficulty to appreciate and compliment her. After delivery of the baby, it took a while for her to lose the weight. Bert became increasingly upset and critical. Bert was now sure that he had married someone just like his mother. Though he couldn't have consciously admitted that, he found himself increasingly critical of her and scolding. But that was, of course, exactly what Martha was already expecting would happen because that's what she had with her father. Under attack, she became agitated and insecure. So she ate more for comfort and grew heavier. As Bert became angrier and more critical, she became more upset, more nervous. The more he got upset, the more she ate, the more she ate, the more he got upset. All of this affected her ability to keep herself and the house neat. The judgments and reactions spun to more and more painful levels until at last she was living with an angry demon and he was living with an overweight wife. What created such a destructive spiral? It was not merely psychological expectancy. It's true that he expected his wife to become heavy and she expected to be criticized by her husband. But psychological expectancy by itself lacks sufficient power to have overcome their determinations to lose weight and stop criticizing. So they had reached a standoff as a couple. They knew things were going wrong, but they didn't have the power to try to change it. Nothing was working. They saw what they were doing to each other, so they came to us for prayer ministry. Being Holy Spirit-filled Christians, they had set their wills to quit. But they came to us for ministry because they found themselves powerless to stop they knew they needed help. The law of judgment does have that kind of power. When Bert judged his mother, the law that declares that the measure he meets out, he must receive, went into effect. When his judgment dishonored his mother, regardless of whether she merited that judgment, and even if the judgment was true, that meant that Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, ensured that life would not go well with him. Most cogently, his judgment was a seed sown that by law had some day to be reaped. Just a tiny mustard seed grows to produce a large tree, so a seed of judgment sown increases the longer it remains unrecognized and unrepented of. So we sow a tiny judgment and reap again and again, larger and larger in life. Every time we do a deed or hold a judgment in the heart, that can be compared to throwing a ball against a wall. If a physicist knows the weight and size of a ball, the distance to the wall, and how much hurling power I have, he can predict when and with what momentum that ball will return. That's a natural law. We can comprehend that easily enough. But God has not made one law for the natural and another for the spiritual. All things are governed by the same basic laws. The law expressed in physics is, for every action, there must be an equal and opposite reaction. In chemistry, it's expressed, every equation or formula must balance. In our moral and spiritual life, it's Galatians 6, 7. Whatsoever a man sows, he will also reap. And then Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with the measure you meet, it shall be measured back to you again. All things will come to resolution and balance. That's God's justice. It's one basic law described differently in each field. The law of sowing and reaping, however, adds another whole dimension. We don't sow one seed and get back one seed. All things increase in God's kingdom. God desires increase in all beneficial things. The first command he gave to Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's Genesis 1.28. The man who buried his talent was reprimanded by our usually gentle Lord Jesus for not at least putting his talent where it could increase. That's Matthew 25.27. Jesus says, quoting the man in the story, Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. So just like increase works on the good side, it also works on the bad side. The longer a judgment continues unrepented of and unconfessed, the greater increment it gains. 
We sow a little spark, and we reap a whole forest fire. We sow to the wind, it says in Hosea, and we reap the whirlwind. So, and the word says, the measure you give will be the measure you get. John says, I think it perhaps means that in the same regard or area of our life, we will receive back rather than the same amount. The loving kindness of God our Father is that he moves on us again and again to prompt us to do some good thing. When we finally act, he lets us reap a hundredfold, as though it were all our own idea. He sends servants on the earth and in heaven to persuade us not to do some bad thing, but when we do, he moves heaven and earth to cause us to repent and confess so he can reap all that evil through his son Jesus on the cross. The law of sowing and reaping was eternally in operation for the entire universe, even before Adam and Eve were ever created. Before the entrance of sin, the law was designed to bring multiplication of blessings, and it still does so today. But the advent of sin meant that the same law from then on rebounds to destruction. Therefore, the Father, knowing from the ground plan of creation what men would do, planned to send Jesus to reap the evil we desire. Proverbs 13.21 says, Adversity pursues sinners, but the righteous will be rewarded with prosperity. The law of God actively causes reward and punishment to come upon us as surely as any other natural law exacts its due. The seed we sow may be tiny, just a little anger, a resentment held against some family member as a child, and then it's forgotten. The longer it remains undetected or neglected, the larger it grows. Back to the hurling power of the ball, we may sow a little ping pong ball, but when it bounces off that wall and comes back at us, it's a nine-story bowling ball heading back at us. It's only the grace of Christ on the cross that delivers us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says, Having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, and which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. There's no cheap grace. Every sin demands resolution. Forgiveness doesn't mean that God looked the other way or changed his laws. Matthew 5, 17 says, Don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. The full legal demand of the law of sowing and reaping was fulfilled in pain upon the body of Jesus in anguish in the heart and soul and spirit of our Lord upon the cross. Nevertheless, the cross is not automatic. If we do not repent and confess, we reap in full despite the fullness of mercy available at a moment's utterance of our confession. So back to the story of Bert and Martha. Since Bert had judged his mother for obesity, he was due to reap obesity. Who would be a more likely person through whom to reap than his wife? His judgment played upon her already latent tendency toward a weight problem, tempting her to gain weight. His necessity to reap what he had sown was therefore returning to him like a mighty wind. For Martha, that was like standing against a hundred mile an hour gale, tempting her to gain weight. In this way, Hebrews 12, 15 is often fulfilled. It says, and by it, a root of bitterness, many be defiled. But Martha had her own set of judgments, which first drew her to marry a man who was even likely to criticize her, and then she pushed him to do it. Her seed, now that it was sown, ripened and was reaped through Bert. Bert and Martha, like most couples, found they were designed to grind against one another's problems That's one of the Sanford sayings, opposites attract. God places us with a mate with whom we are perfectly designed to grind. And unless you think that's a bad thing, it's not. The grinding process is what's necessary in order for us to knock the rough spots off of each other. When you were single, you were able to hide from some of these things. Once you get married, you've got someone that's there that's going to force those things to the surface. And because God loves us, he wants those brought to the cross. Thank you, God, for my wife. Thank you, God, for my husband, the person with whom I am perfectly designed to grind. Back to the quote from the book. Bert's judgments exactly matched what Martha thought she was most likely to become, and her judgments perfectly matched his carnal tendencies. Bert and Martha are not unique. We have found bitter root judgments, the Sanford say, We have found bitter root judgments and expectancies in every couple to whom we minister. Bitter root judgments are the most common, most basic sins 
not just in all marital relationships, but perhaps in all of life. We found that these three simple laws affect all of life. Number one, life will go well for us in every area in which we could in fact honor our parents, and life will not go well in every area in which we could not honor them. Number two, we'll receive harm in the same areas of life in which we have meted out judgment against others. And number three, we will most surely reap what we have sown. We regard these laws as the most powerful keys that God has revealed to his people for the healing of relationships. These three laws are the basis of almost all our prayer ministry. Most couples enter into a relationship with little or no awareness of what they are bringing in with them, what's in their heart, or what power those unconscious forces have to influence, drive, and control their perceptions, their attitudes, and their behavior. That's the end of the quote. Oh, that was a mouthful, and that's something worth really pondering on. You might remember at the beginning of this teaching, I mentioned that this teaching has the potential to bring you major freedom in your life, but you've got to be able to get past the parts that seem contradictory and confusing, and I can just tell you from experience that this is one of those places that this teaching gets a little confusing. The dilemma is that most people have done this. We've all judged somebody in our lives to one degree or another. Maybe it was major, maybe it was minor, but we all have something we've judged someone for. And based on God's law, that judgment is a sin, and it needs to be repented of. And that just doesn't seem fair to most people. We've had people hear Bert and Martha's story and just flatly reject the whole thing. No way. They just say, how could it be that something in Bert could have caused his wife to gain weight and not be able to lose it? Isn't each person able to stand on their own two feet? What about her willpower? What about Kona Weight Watchers? This all just sounds like some big cop-out. And what about all the people who've been severely abused and ended up hating their fathers for some terrible thing that happened? Are you telling me that it was a sin for that child to hate their father? You've got to be kidding. But sorry to say, we're not kidding. <laughs> and practical experience over the last 12 years of really being deeply involved in this material, I can tell you hundreds of people, hundreds of people that have just taken this by faith and believed that it was true and repented of judging, have seen major changes in their relationships, mostly with parents, but with many different people in their lives, just by confessing the sin, repenting and asking for forgiveness of the sin of judging and not honoring. We have seen relationship shift. That would be too many for me to ever list here, but I am fully persuaded that this is true. Let's just use a different example. Instead of Bert and Martha, just assume there's a five-year-old boy who lives in a home with an alcoholic father. And if that's you, I apologize. I don't mean to bring up any sensitive topics here, but alcoholism is one of the most destructive things that can happen in a little child's life. We know that little five-year-old boy is going to experience much fear, much confusion, and much instability. And it would just be natural for that little boy to hold resentments towards his father which could easily turn to hatred, and that turns into judgment and sin. So people that get confused about this teaching ask, how can that be a sin? Isn't the child justified to harbor anger towards an alcoholic father? And the answer is yes. In the natural, we understand why he would do it, but that's really not the issue here. The issue is that we're dealing with laws, and laws like gravity, you could disagree with gravity, but you can't defy gravity. Those laws are in operation, whether we agree with them or not. So if the first law is honor your father and mother, that life may go well with you, it doesn't say you can honor them only when they're honorable. And then the second law says that we're going to sow and then we reap. And as described by Jesus, that means you're going to get back the same measure in that same area. John qualified it for, but actually with more because of the law of increase, that, that will be measured back to you. That little five-year-old boy doesn't realize at the time that he's setting himself up for future problems, he's just reacting to life. But maybe this can help you understand the severity of the pain and the destruction that entered into the world when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. The laws of God's universe were already in place before the fall. Once sin separated us from God, we were helpless and hopeless until a Savior came and provided a way for forgiveness of that sin and reconciliation for us back into a right-standing relationship with God. It's only through the cross and resurrection that the wages of these sins of judgment and dishonoring our parents can be negated. So, 
We go back to the book, Transforming the Inner Man. It says, it's true that when one receives Christ as Lord and Savior, all that bitter root system is dealt a death blow. But notice that St. Paul, who was writing to Christians when we read in Hebrews, again, we believe Hebrews was written by Paul. He says in 1215 of Hebrews, see to it that no root of bitterness springing up. Note the words, springing up like a plant suddenly appearing from a hidden root. He did not say cut off the visible branches or deal with the obvious, but rather see to it that no hidden beneath the surface problematic root become manifest and cause trouble. If you can truly grasp the few simple laws on which God has constructed the operation of human nature, that single key is enough to begin to unlock the myriad of mysteries of the human heart. Once you understand the base of law behind all human relationships, you have the foundation on which to begin to uncover those hidden roots. Think of Einstein. The genius of Einstein was to discover the simplicity of law behind the seemingly impossibly complex construction of all of nature. That little formula, E equals MC squared, is one of the most elegant ever discovered. And the genius of the Word of God, similarly, is to lay bare the simplicity of life. It's as though all life, just like fractions, is built upon simple common denominators. Now, I know when I say fractions, some people... <laughs> have bad memories of math class, but just think of one over two, right? A half. The one up on the top is the numerator. The two on the bottom is the denominator. The comparison here is variables and constants. The one on the top is the variables. That's the way we go through life, handling situations differently, depending on what we're going through at any given time and depending on our knowledge of the word and depending on what's influencing us at the time. The denominators on the bottom are the constants. We've got variables and constants. The numerators, John Sanford says, is how we act, and they vary as often as there are individuals who mess up. But the denominators are the laws of God. They're few, they're basic, they're universal, and they're simple. God gives us the single basic key to life throughout the Bible, but especially in the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. Those moral laws are not somebody's opinion or guess as to how life ought to run. They're not mankind's invention. We didn't learn them over centuries of trial and error. And they're not just a bunch of rules which if only everybody would follow, this would be a better world. No, they are God's description of the way reality works. E equals MC squared, but in the spirit and in the heart of a human. The Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount are the architect's blueprint for building the house of family life. They're the chemist's formula for brewing safe mixtures of men and women. They're the engineer's principles for construction and operation of all relationships. The poet Longfellow, quoting another poet, said, The mills of God's justice grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. Boy, does that sum it up. You may have had a resentment as a little child. Decades go by. It's not dealt with. It was never repented of. And now you find yourself as an adult and you're reaping some really bad fruit with no connection of cause and effect back to what caused that thing. And it's as simple as just seeking the Lord and allowing Holy Spirit to reveal. That's what he does. He's the revelator. He'll reveal what that root cause is. You take that thing to the cross, you dismantle that structure, and it no longer has a hold over you. Now God breathes his resurrection power into you, and you come out the other side of that cross, out of that tomb, get unwrapped of all the grave clothes like Lazarus, and you come out a different person, transformed by his power. Back to John's quote again. Because the practical man does not see immediate retribution, he fails to believe. But that unbelief has no effect whatsoever upon the operation of God's law. That man and his descendants will reap without fail no matter what he thinks, what he believes, or what he disbelieves. Even Christians, people been saved a long time, still can be dealing with unbelief in their heart. Millions of Christians have never yet become so grounded in God's word that his law is written indelibly into their hearts. In their heart, they still believe they can do whatever they want, and there's no effect. In this generation, people don't understand cause and effect because the laws of God have gone out of their minds. 
John says, I want you to understand the point. If I drop my pen, why does it fall? Everyone knows. The answer's obvious. It's gravity. But suppose I don't catch my pen and it falls to the ground and breaks. Was God mad at the pen? No, of course not. It was just the operation of law. Change the scene. And now it's a woman who says, I want to have sex with a man who's not my husband. I don't think there should be any consequences. Does it make any difference what she thinks? No. The penalty has to come because there was a violation of the law. But we've lost this understanding of cause and effect. Change the scene again. What if a man says, I want to engage in a homosexual relationship with another man? Well, in Leviticus, it's written that that's an abomination for a man to lie with another man. In Romans chapter 1, verse 27, it says that they would receive in their own persons the due penalty of their error. That speaks of the sin of homosexuality. So whether we agree with the laws or not makes no difference. It isn't that God was furious, hates people that make mistakes. No, God so loved the world that he knew that we'd be sinful and rebellious and would set in motion these forces that we'd have to reap. So he sent Jesus to save us from that sin. And another point that is made throughout this teaching is that we do not blame our parents. And this is a quote from Transforming the Inner Man. Whatever parents were, saints or hellions, normal people or psychos, what's important is the child's reaction. We've seen cases of children hellishly abused who nevertheless became loving and gentle adults. We don't believe man is formed by his circumstances, by his environment, or by other people. We're comprehending by the word of God, which proclaims that by our spirit, we have chosen how we react. In every way that we've reacted sinfully, we've set in motion forces that must be reaped unless mercy prevails. We don't blame parents by seeing that the root and the trunk of all life is formed with them. It's always the counselee, the one receiving the ministry, who must bear his own load of guilt. That's from Galatians chapter 6, verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. So we go back to John and Paula's own testimony in their marriage, how they started to identify the areas that they needed help. I think it'll be a blessing to you to just hear what they would say personally. This is Paula speaking. She said, at the beginning of my marriage with John, I had some awareness that I was imperfect, unfulfilled, and needing completion. But like most young brides, I felt I was beginning my new life rather clear, clean, and fresh. I had no idea what a large and complex bundle I was bringing into that new life. Like multitudes of Christians, I did not understand that though my sins had been forgiven, I was still the shape of the person my experiences in life and my reactions to them had made me to be. I did not know I'd be inclined to see my husband and relate to him according to the attitudes and expectations of my flesh until in Christ I could experience interior cutting free from the past and growing into that new life. The weighty contents of that bundle, which included my nationality, culture, race, creed, religion, parents' training, modeling of my parents, sibling rivalries, hurts and wounds, fears, joys, judgments, skills, successes, failures, hopes and dreams— what I believe should be done, and the things I believe should not be done, all drag me down to prevent me from being able to provide John an uninhibited sharing of myself. They were also at times the trigger points for ammunition that I would use to hurl at John. Another factor had to be dealt with as well. I held an ideal image of who John was and who he had to be in order to compliment me. I tried hard to be the person I thought I was, and I'd like to think I succeeded in some measure. I hoped that John's shape of person would fit mine comfortably. So where I had weaknesses and undeveloped areas, I earnestly hoped that he would be strong and capable so as to fill and strengthen me. And where I had areas of natural strength, I hoped he would have the decency to stand back and give me room to express myself. I thought our coming together should be as effortless and painless as possible. We had not been married long before I discovered that we were not at all shaped for a struggle, let alone coming together as one. It was obvious that the closer we moved to one another, the more we were going to have to make adjustments. It took a while for the two of us to realize that we were both a mess, and that it was part of God's plan in calling us together that we should grind 
blessedly, <laughs> that we should grind blessedly against each other's character and so become polished and perfect. God gives us a beloved enemy to force us spiritually lazy people to face what's undealt with in our flesh, or else we'd go through life ever congratulating ourselves that we're okay without him. Unfortunately, what happens in many marriages is that when couples begin to grow close enough to one another that the grinding and polishing process is going on in earnest, they withdraw from that pain. They erect defensive walls to hide their vulnerability and find themselves in a marriage with symptoms of defense and flight. The husband lives on his side of the wall, spending more and more time at the office, immersed in hobbies, playing golf, anything to avoid prolonged exposure at home where it hurts. And he looks for places to express himself where there's no threat to his ego. The wife pours herself into her children, spends time at crafts or clubs or church, talks to her women friends about the things she no longer feels it's safe to confide in her husband. Being together becomes excruciating. It seems only to accentuate the loneliness they both feel in isolation from one another. Occasionally, they may throw rocks at one another from behind the wall. If you'd only change, I'd be all right. And then the world's culture just feeds them continually with lies. If it feels good, it's right. Love is warm and fuzzy and makes you feel tingly all over. If you were really in love, you'd be living happily ever after. If you aren't happy in a relationship, get out of it. Their marriage certainly doesn't feel good, and they begin to think, we must have made a mistake. I have the wrong partner. God never intended for us to be together. And so one or the other or both of them wander off from the marriage in search of that ideal partner, quote unquote, that soulmate, quote unquote, who must be out there somewhere. The wandering partner may indeed find someone who initially makes him feel good, but because he has not let the Lord yet deal with that thing in his heart, he'll choose that new relationship with the same eyes, the same sensitivities, and the same criteria that equipped him for choosing in the first place. And should he marry a second time, the moment that new mate begins to penetrate his heart, he'll find himself repeating that same pattern all over again because he never got to the root. More cogently, the same necessity to reap seeds of judgment has not yet stopped on the cross. They're going to most likely still draw a mate through whom he's going to reap. Only this time, it's going to be worse because of the law of increase. In this way, some people go from marriage to marriage to marriage, right on into dead-ended frustration, and they wrongly think, I guess I'm just not marriage material, when all it was was they never got to the root. By the same token, people go from church to church, and from group to group, and from friend to friend, searching endlessly for someone to make them feel good, with no challenge to grow or change. There's only one answer for any marriage or any vital relationship. That's to exchange that dividing wall of hostility for the cross of Jesus Christ. It's to stop all demands that the other person must change. It's to die daily to self, continually asking the Lord, what's in me that's contributing to the breakdown of this marriage? Lord, why doesn't my mate get better just by living with me? What is there in me that needs to die? Whatever it is, bring it to death. We have to confess, Lord, Paul is speaking now, I can't be loving to John, but you can. Give me the love that you have, then I might give it to him. She could say, I can't forgive, but you can. Express your forgiveness through me. It's to ask the Lord to enable compassionate identification with the other's hurts and fears, and then wisdom to minister to those feelings. Identify and deal with past issues on the cross of Christ so that they no longer have any power to affect what lies ahead. And here's a tough one. We have to embrace each step of God's sometimes painful plan to transform our lives as we live together with our mates and work through our problems together. If one partner in a marriage refuses to enter into that process of transformation in the Lord, all is not lost. The unbelieving partner is sanctified through the believing partner. That's 1 Corinthians 7.14. What happens in the heart of one affects the other, if not consciously, at least beneath the level of consciousness. Eventually, it'll bear good fruit. The more immediate effect of one partner's finding a stopping place on the cross is just that. The vicious cycle is stopped. 
The remaining partner may continue to behave in the same old habit patterns, but those ways find no place to land in the Christian. They can no longer hook into sensitive trigger points. John goes on to say, The most pathetic thing that Paul and I see daily in prayer ministry is that day by day, year after year, good Christian people are driven by forces of which they have no awareness. We're not speaking merely of people being conditioned by wrong thinking and bad habits. Those are bad enough. As ministers have been doing this for decades, we can see it. We can see that the real cause of the problem is this invisible operation of the inevitable laws of judgment, especially sowing and reaping. Those act with impersonal and unrelenting force in human life until we come to the cross of Christ and Christ intervenes. It pains us because Christians ought to believe they should know and see and should let Jesus Christ do what he came to do, which is to set them free. But too many Christians have failed to see. It's our desire that Christians will come to see how the law of sowing and reaping affects them drastically, day in and day out, in the millions of details of common daily living. It's absolutely necessary that every believer learn to think in terms of the operation of God's laws in his or her daily life. You must see, you must understand what you did as a little child, or could even be doing now as an adult, could be like a boomerang, swishing to return with even greater momentum, now in the present or sometime down the road in the future. Unless you're able to comprehend that every action in life must reap a result, you'll find yourself continually being hit on the blind side and smashed by events and then wondering why. Life will seem unfair. The reason we teach this topic is in order to help you and the entire body of Christ see these deceptive hidden roots and then repent of the sin so you can stop the reaping of destruction that you've been experiencing. The laws of God will operate whether we know of them or are ignorant, whether we approve of them or disapprove, whether we love them or hate them, believe them or disbelieve them. God's impartial laws will affect us whether we unintentionally activate them by judgments as children or intentionally sin as adults. It makes no difference. Law is law. And if we disbelieve, what we think or feel about the reality and effectiveness of the laws of God will have about as much effect as a gnat trying to knock down the Empire State Building. The laws of God will roll right on, controlling the universe no matter what our puny little minds think or don't think. Another thing, we must understand one vitally important fact. Our human free will is so precious to God that he will not let the efficacy of the cross be applied to us without our consent. In each detail of our life, it's the same. Our gentle Lord is always standing outside some new sequential inner door, softly knocking, but the only latch is on our side. So those bitter roots are not normally taken care of until we open the door and invite Jesus in to accomplish that specific task. When you become aware of a bitter root in your own life or in the life of someone to whom you've begun to minister, there are several factors that will need your attention. First, there's the original event. The grown person to whom you're now ministering may have no awareness of the problem, but we're not dealing first with feelings of the flesh. We're dealing with the facts and law by faith. Forgiveness for the sin of judgments should be pronounced if present circumstances indicate that they're reaping from a problem. When the person is experiencing reaping a bad fruit, it could very well be that judgments and some kind of sinful actions were what planted that seed in the first place. Even when the person is protesting you that they have no recollection. As you pray with that person, they don't need to feel anything during ministry or prayer in order for it to be effective. You're acting in the middle. You're standing between that person and God, offering assurance of the forgiveness and ministering beyond the adult to that wounded person on the inside. Forgiveness needs to be said several ways so that the inner one can take hold and receive. Ask that person both to forgive and to accept forgiveness purely by faith, if they have to. And it's by faith because sometimes they just don't remember and they say, I don't have any recollection of hating my father or holding a grudge. But if the indication is that the fruit says there's a problem, then they have to do it by faith. And forgiveness is essential. Without it, no subsequent healing can happen. It says in Mark 11:25, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Reactions to that original event or events created structures in that person's character. 
These are practices of judgment and psychological bitter root expectancy that only the cross can transform. Pray aloud with the person. Pray with that one you're ministering to. Ask Jesus' work on the cross be applied to that practice in the flesh. It'll help, and it might even be necessary for that person to say in prayer, I hate it, I reject it, I don't want it. Maybe you remember a scene from the movie A Beautiful Mind. The lead character says, you're not real, and I don't have to listen to you anymore. And that's how it feels when we start to recognize these root systems and we learn to hate them. That scene's a great example of learning how to hate that old structure enough to give God permission to dismantle it. There's another quote from that movie, A Beautiful Mind. If you haven't seen it, it deals with a college professor who's got a progressive mental illness that's causing him to be delusional. So one of the things the, the character in the movie says, I still see things that are not there. I just choose not to acknowledge them. Like a diet of the mind, I choose not to indulge certain appetites. And that can be very similar to what we're going through as this dismantling process is happening in our lives. If it's a bitter root judgment, once that process gets underway, we can recognize it. We may still see it, but we can choose not to acknowledge those roots. And then Romans 12.9 in the Amplified Bible says, Hate what is evil, loathe all ungodliness, turn in horror from wickedness, hold fast to that which is good. Sometimes overturning a bitter root requires upsetting an entire stance of life that we or the person we're ministering to has developed, and they could be defining themselves. Their whole self-worth is defined by that structure that's now got to die. It may mean coming to hate a fleshly righteousness where we've been congratulating ourselves in the past that we were the good guys taking a stand for Jesus and being persecuted by all the bad guys. But if it's a bitter root, it's producing bad fruit, and it's got to die. Once you've experienced forgiveness and freedom from the bitter roots of the past, or prayed with someone else, and been a witness of the transformation in that person's life, you've got to be careful that those little tugs that try to bring them back won't succeed. The big battle might be won, but there might be hundreds of pockets of little guerrilla resistance that you're dealing with in your flesh. Habit structures are like weeds. They keep sending up sprouts from a long, persistent root system until every part of the old root is uprooted or finally too weak to send up a shoot. You may have dandelions on your front lawn. Well, you can't just go with your lawnmower and cut them off because the next day they spring right back up again. It's only when you get to the roots and they get uprooted from underneath the ground that they disappear. And then John closes by saying, The blessed end of transformation of bitter roots is first that we find ourselves continually surprised because things just don't happen like they used to. New things happen. People compliment us who never did so before, or they give us affection, or whatever is the reverse of what used to happen in our relationships. Good rather than bad accidents happen. Things begin to work together for good visibly, One can't miss seeing it. Perhaps the most blessed shock is that often the very people we've been hating become the ones we love and appreciate the most. Life takes on a new lease. It's as though new vistas open before us, and we come to realize they were there all along. We just couldn't see them. What used to bother us now falls like water off a duck's back. We giggle instead of tensing up. We laugh with those we used to get mad at for laughing at us. And we see others and our own selves with real compassion. Truly, in that area of our hearts, we've come to experience what it's like to be born anew. That's the end of the quote from the book. I just want to tell you, this has been a profound lesson in my life and in the lives of hundreds of people in our church and beyond. So I'll end it now with a prayer for Bitter Roots that you can work through and and fill in your own issues that, that you're going to deal with. I'm going to play two different parts in the prayer. First, the person who's repenting, who we'll call Joe, and then the part of the person who's praying and pronouncing forgiveness. So Joe praying, Lord, I recognize I've judged my father for not being there for me, and I've locked myself into that same behavior. I choose to forgive him for hurting me, and I choose to release my right to hold this offense against him, knowing that it's up to you only to judge all of us. Please forgive me for the sinful ways I've reacted and for the ways in which I've done the very same thing to others. Lord Jesus, forgive me for judging my father. Now I see that I'm reaping the same pattern throughout my life. 
I choose to forgive and release my anger and bitterness to you, Lord. Please remove it from my heart. And then the prayer minister would come and pronounce forgiveness. So I'll be the prayer minister now and say, I forgive you, Joe. And as a servant of Jesus Christ, I say to you that as you've forgiven those who wounded you, so also has the Lord forgiven you. Lord, I ask you break each judgment that has been named and remove it from Joe's life. I ask you to consume the reaping of all the years of sowing and destruction. Replace it with your blessing. And I ask you to bring experiences into his life as evidence that these judgments are no longer operating. Strengthen him in the inner man to be able to practice new responses and continue to bring awareness of any other judgments and the perfection of your timing, Lord. Amen.